Hello and welcome back to Guillotined 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today what we're going to do is, is show how everything we've learned about quantum numbers really ties into the very periodic table itself. You'll be amazed at how much of this stuff is apparent down to the shape of the periodic table and some of the trends that we've talked about before in terms of the different regions of the periodic table. So let's look at some of the stuff behind. Think of this as sort of the Da Vinci Code of the periodic table. <laughs> um, one of the first things you can notice is the handy order filling chart corresponds directly to the periodic table. If you start going up atomic number, uh, what you will find is that as you move through the elements, you'll be moving through the different regions of the handy order filling chart. Now, technically, the handy word filling chart does go beyond F. There's G, there's H, there's I. For some reason, they skip J and then they go to K. Um, but these uh, subshells are only, I guess, used when electrons get excited to higher states, I assume. So we really don't have to go beyond the F subshell for anything. As you go through the handy word filling chart, you never go above F. But as you go through, you'll see uh, 1S, 2S, 2P, 3s, 3p, 4s. Um, but when you get to the d blocks, though, it actually shifts down one number. So it won't be 3, it won't be 4d that you first hit, it'll be 3d, and then you'll go back to 4p. And the same thing happens again when you get to the f block. That they will shift down again. Um, so it does work out. Now, now, I still think the handy order filling chart is easier, but it is kind of neat to see how this reflects those sort of electron patterns you might have learned a long time ago, the 2, 8, 18, 32, etc. Again, I've said before, the number of electrons on an energy level, I don't see as very uh, useful or relevant, but knowing the outermost electrons, I think, is very important. Um, one of the things uh, you'll see is that the number of outermost electrons explains a lot of the family properties. Uh, for instance, um, all the halogens have two uh, electrons in the outermost s orbital and five electrons in the outermost p subshell. Uh, and this actually corresponds to what are called the valence electrons. And so we talked about the magic number being eight for valence electrons before. Well, the valence electrons are the outermost s and p subshells combined. What they do is they, they hybridize into new shaped orbitals. Again, that's not too important right now. But just understand that the core of the S and P is what creates the valence shell. Which also explains why helium is a noble gas but only has two electrons. Because it only has two valence electrons in its outer shell because it's got no P subshell. That's pretty big. We could stop the lesson right there and call it a pretty big day. <laughs> um, there are a lot of exceptions to the off bow principle to the filling order we've learned. Uh, many of them have to deal with the idea of in the D subshell, the transition metals, uh, they will often pilfer an electron from the outermost S to get them a half filled or a fully filled D subshell. Um, again, the, the, this, these exceptions are out there. You can learn more about them if you'd like. Um, you know, but, but I think that those are minor based to the big things we've learned so far. Um, if you're not a valence electron, you are sometimes called the core electrons. Uh, you'll be surprised how little we actually deal with the core electrons in chemistry. Mainly we're dealing with the valence electrons. You know, think about ionic compounds, about the idea of how they gain and lose electrons. All right. Anyway, there's places to learn about all this stuff, like AP chemistry. <laughs> um, and real quick also, let me today show you the... Uh, how, how the very properties of the regions of the periodic table tie into valence electrons. Noble gases are considered inert, and they're inert because they have a full outer shell, which means they have full outermost S and P subshells. And it's all outermost S and P, uh, not necessarily what the outermost uh, shell is. The metals are such a big region of the periodic table because for a large part of the, of the uh, region, they're putting electrons down into the D and F subshells. <laughs> And so as you're working your way across the transition metals, a lot of the times the properties don't change too much. And so that's why if you were to pull a random element based on atomic number out of a hat, they'd probably end up being metals. Because again, you're putting an electron in the S, an electron in the S, and then you're dumping them into the Ds and Fs until they come back out, and then you start filling up the P, and then the metallic property starts going away, which is pretty cool too. I have less to say about the noble gases, I mean the uh, nonmetals. Uh, again, as they get fuller to a valence shell, they, they become more uh, nonmetal in behavior. 
uh, and in properties, and they want to gain electrons instead of losing electrons. That's quite not quite as ep epic as the noble gas and, and metallic properties based on quantum numbers. And again, the metalloids or the semi-metals are in between. But I, I think the big ideas of you know, how it actually forms the shape of the periodic table is pretty impressive, and also how it uh, shows properties. So anyway, thanks for watching today. Uh, tomorrow we'll continue to talk about ra radius. Have a great day.